All right. Thank you for coming out for this very special edition of the Radio Juxtapose podcast with none other than San Francisco-based artist Ben Venom. Um, we would. This is kind of the fanciest setup we've had. Hands down. Hands down. Really, really nice. Um, official. Official. Uh, obviously, we want to thank Vans for hosting us and letting us do not only Juxpo's doing the takeover for the next couple weeks in the store, but also letting us record one of our podcasts here as well. So this will actually go live to the rest of the world. Yeah. Shortly. Intermittently, we're just going to be sort of bragging about how comfortable our feet are in these delightful <laughs> new Vans slip-ons. <laughs> You've not been forced to say that in any way. Wait, Thanks, wait, <laughs> what, wait. This is really good for people who are going to listen to this, but can you stand up and show your jacket that you got customized just a second ago? Oh, right. Look at this oh, bad boy right yeah. here. Woo! Look at this guy. So Ben, ben will be doing that. That, yeah. yeah. Uh, from 12 wow. to 3 tomorrow, a Mother's Day special. Yeah. For people who are coming into the store. You prefer denim, though, don't you? Denim is probably best, but yeah, I'll do any jacket. Bring your mom. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, has has anyone uh, just jumping straight in? Has sure. anyone brought in anything like super weird for you oh, to yes. stick a patch on? Oh yeah. That's, we're in now. What is the weirdest thing anyone's asked you to stick some, something like, on? It was like some embroidered jacket that had all kinds of crazy stuff on it, and it was actually a a curator who brought it in, and I put a patch on the back of it, and everyone that was part uh, it was a curator of a museum, and all of her employees came in, and I was like, I bet you can probably pick which jacket is Renee's, and everyone's like, that one. And there's one that was like, my patch was on it, then it had all this crazy embroidery. So I was like, it was perfect. Is there ever, yeah. you feel a little extra pressure because it's like a curator of a museum, that you have to like, uh, yeah, I better, I better knock yeah, this out really yeah. well. Yeah, I was like, you, I probably shouldn't screw that up. Have you ever had anything where you're like, nah, I'm not touching that, I can't, this is like, a, you know, a, like the rarest of the rare. No I man, can't. I'll go into it, screw it, yeah. I mean, gotta put my mark on it. I like that. Yeah. Looking, Look, looking at my stain on it. <laughs> <laughs> looking at the, the quilts here, like all the things that you accumulate to make a work, do you, do you just like live to collect things that you know will go into your work? Is your studio full of just piles and piles of, um, of and stuff? And stuff, yeah. Like, yeah. Are, you, are you kind of a hoarder in that way? Oh, that's a difficult question to answer. Cause, Good, we got difficult ones already. Because my, my well, wife is here, so I don't want to. <laughs> make our apartment seem like a dump, but uh, yeah, it's, the back part of our apartment is just the door is closed most of the time, so you know, take that for what That's it's worth. That's the venom zone. Yeah, as in like, don't go in there. It's well, a mess. What venom zone? It's a what total kind of, mess. Well, what kind of stuff? Like what? Everything, man. Like um, jeans, obviously, leather jackets, t-shirts. Um, you know, Kristen Farr sent me a bunch of felt. Like rainbow felt, which is super well. awesome, you know. I use it all, you know. Like, uh, you know, she, she was kidding. She's like, "Yo, Ben Venom is in his rainbow period," and I was like, "Yeah, because you gave me that great fabric." But um, what else? Like um, underwear, you know. You've done a lot uh, of underwear. I've done some pieces of underwear. This is what the people are here for. They yeah. want to know. They want to know the sexy stuff. Well, yeah, only the <laughs> only the good stuff. Yeah, no skid marks, but yeah, uh, used, you know. primarily used primarily underwear. Used. <laughs> But, uh, it's a that, big market. That brings actually. up a good point there, because like most of my work is like donated and/or recycled. So occasionally I'll go on eBay and buy stuff that's like used. And this one time I bought like this awesome T-shirt that was used, and I just I just assume that people would wash stuff before they send it to someone in the mail that no, paid money for it. Absolutely not. Not the case. This thing came out of the package and I almost threw up. I mean, this guy, it was like tank top, the sleeves got cut off, just, I mean, oh. stain galore. It was like, ah. Oh. There is there's an element of upcycling and kind of reusing to your, to your practice. Was this ever a kind of an environmentally conscious decision, or was it just something that, that just kind of ties into what it is that you do? It was a little bit of both, but I, it, primarily it was an environmental decision because living in San Francisco, we were one of the first cities in the U.S. to ban plastic bags. And um, for me, that was really important. Just this idea of reuse and upcycle, um, not just in San Francisco, but in everywhere, you know, all around the world. And textiles is another thing that gets really thrown away. And San Francisco, more recently, has started to um, recycle textiles. Like there's donation bins and things like that, which I, I, th I thought was really important. And that kind of parlays into my work. So, 
you know, here's, you know, you have a bunch of fabric, be it a t-shirt or a pair of jeans or a leather jacket that meant a lot to you, but let's say you've got some stains on it or some unexplained stains, tear or rip or whatever, and, um, or it's too small, you grew out of it, but you just can't throw it away. Here's an opportunity, you can send it to me, please wash it, and, or dry clean it, and send it to me, I'll cut it up and put it into a piece of artwork, and now, it's, now you, a piece of you is in the work, it's not just mine. So the quilts that you see here, a lot of the fabric was donated, um, so it's not just my quilt, it's like our quilt, because everyone's personal memories or stains or et cetera are now a part of that, so it's like, one way to look at my art is, this, is like a collection of memories sewn together in, in, a, in a functional piece of artwork. So it, that's really important for me. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to you if it's your friends' things or if it's things that you found or things that you kind of buy yourself. Right, it, right. That's not, it, can it often be part of the story? That, or that's, is that is important, but that's not my primary, um, that's not something I, like if, if there's someone sends me something that doesn't have like a, a stain on it that doesn't have a good story, like, I'm, I'll, I'll still use it, you know. It's, it's the fact that, it, you know, everything has some type of history to it, right? Some have more of a distinctive history than others. Um, for instance, I'm doing a commission piece for someone right now, and he sent me a, a couple t-shirts, and one of the shirts, um, he had, like, a very um, special moment in it at one point when he was growing up. And, and so now it's going to be on, on his jacket. Wait, hold on a second. For there people, could be so many things. Who are listening, <laughs> for people who are listening at, at home, he put quotes around special moment. Yeah. Okay. No, he's doing yeah, a little he's, circle with the pointy finger going yeah, into we'll just, it. We'll just leave it at that. Out of it. Very adolescent. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, right. yeah. that was probably our lowest moment. We're, <laughs> we can go lower if you want. Yeah. In the history of this podcast, we just went full bro. Uh, <laughs> so look, I want we've, to... We've gone bro before. Yeah, is, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I, we kind of jumped like 10,000 steps right there in loads okay. of areas that I want to cover, but you're not... You know, one of them being, you know, you live in San Francisco, but you're not originally from San Francisco. You're Correct. originally from Atlanta, Georgia. Right. So can you maybe describe what the area or the, the neighborhood that you were growing up in during the 90s? Yeah, sure. Uh, what, what that was like, because I really want to get into kind of try and figure out how we got to here. Right. So uh, I tell people I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, but more specifically, I'm from Marietta. Well, we would say, we would say Mayetta. Um, <laughs> Southern, yeah. Uh, and where I grew up, um, I grew up in a really big neighborhood. It was, in, it was a suburb of Atlanta. It's, not, it's maybe about 30 miles or so outside of downtown Atlanta. And um, it was a very large neighborhood and a lot of kids in the neighborhood. But I grew up right around the corner from where Lester Maddox lived, and he was a former mayor. And he was, um, you know, for segregation and all this. So he has a pretty rough history tied to him. And I lived right around the corner from him. And as, as fate would have it, they built a super Walmart right across the street from his house. So F him, right? You know, <laughs> history does come back around and eventually it takes the shit on you um, for people like that. But I grew up right around the corner from him. And then in the other direction um, is where Newt Gingrich lived when he was Speaker of the House back in the 90s during like the whole neoconservative takeover. Oh. So that kind of sets the stage for where I grew up. Um, it was very conservative, um, religious, here in the Bible Belt. Um, pretty, you know, of that nature, Republican, et cetera, a lot, like extreme. And so now I live in San Francisco, and my wife and I live in, in the Haight-Ashbury, which is like District 5, which is the more liberal district within San Francisco. So I grew up in this, on this side of the sphere, and I was like, well, I'm going to go to the complete opposite, right? So, um, and that kind of, that's where I'm at now. But let's... Ben Venom as a kid, as, yeah. a, as a creative kid, were you, were you sort of collecting things as a kid? Were, were, could you find any sort of kind of thread as like a young person kind of maybe getting interested in art? Or is it more that you were getting interested into certain kind of subcultures because you kind of felt yourself to be uh, perhaps a fish out of water a little bit in that neighborhood. Yeah, I was a little fish out of water, but I had a pretty big group of friends that were all into like punk rock and heavy metal and skateboarding. So there was a scene? There was, we were kind of confined, you know, we're, there wasn't a huge scene. And there was like maybe 10 of us and we we're different age ages, but we all went downtown Atlanta. And then a lot of us ended up moving downtown when we got older. Um, so we kind of parlayed into that. But as far as like collecting or being an artist, from a very early age, I always wanted to draw. I was always 
interested in drawing from really, really, really young. And um, I didn't really collect much. I mean, I collected baseball cards, and um, yeah, that's about it. And I didn't really, I was never really someone who like was tied to material things, you know? Uh, Seems ironic. I know. <laughs> Oddly enough, right. for, to be a contradiction now, obviously, but. Um, yeah, that changed. Yeah, that obviously changed. Yeah, I was never into like staunchly collecting anything, but as far as like being interested in the subcultures, yeah, like back in the 90s, you know, it's like pre-internet, you had to go search for the stuff that you're interested in. You couldn't just Google it. That didn't exist then, you know. It's kind of showing my age. I'm in my early 40s now. And we got the internet at my house when I was like in high school, like maybe my sophomore year, I think. They had the internet, Net Netscape 2.0 or something. something so about where, was this, <laughs> where was this catalyst moment for you where you suddenly kind of, or was this, this entry into quilts and patches, yeah. was this a part of just a gradual process or was there a catalyst moment for you that sparked this? And well, that's kind of like a multi-answer multi to that. So what brought me to quilts was back in 2006, there was the G's Bin Quilt Show at the De Young Museum. And I saw that show, and I was really interested in that because they're from Alabama, which is not too far from where I grew up. They're from a very rural part of Alabama. It's called G's Bin because of the river. And they're from like the Black Belt region because the soil there is really fertile. And it's also, and then tied, secondly, that's largely African-American population. And um, it's remote because of that bend in the, in the river. But uh, I saw that show um, at, at the De Young Museum. This is while I was in graduate school at the San Francisco Art Institute. And I was really blown away by that type of, uh, that, that they were making quilts from used material. And when I was in grad school, I had already, already started doing a little bit of sewing, but I was making like flags and banners. And then when I saw that G's Ben show, I was like, oh, I, I should make a quilt. So I, I bought a book that was called Quilting Basics 101. I had no idea how to make a quilt. And the reason why I bought that book was because it had a lot of photographs. Because when it says like stitch in the ditch or fold on the bias or whatever, I, I didn't know what that meant. But it had a photograph that explained it. So then I kind of like, Went from there, you know, taught myself how to make a quilt, and then just kind of kept learning and making mistakes as I went. Um, that's what initially brought me into making, uh, doing primarily textiles. But also, what brought me into doing textiles was this, again, this idea of like functionality. Because not that there's anything wrong with making just simply a pretty picture to hang on the wall, but for me personally, from my, from an artistic standpoint, for myself, I wanted to do something that just lived beyond just being aesthetically pleasing. I wanted something that had that was multifaceted. It could be this, 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 and this. So with the work that I do now, textiles has enabled me to do work that's hopefully you like the, what, what you see, hopefully it's aesthetically pleasing, hopefully you like the concepts behind it, hopefully you like the fact that I'm like merging fringes of, you know, fringe culture with like, you know, craft and uh, fine art. But that, if you don't like any of that, that's fine. Because at the end of the day, it's still functional. So it still serves a distinct purpose in the world. All the quilts that I make are 100% a quilt, technically speaking. They have the top layer, the middle layer, and the bottom layer, so, and that's really important to me. Okay, so, said a lot, that's a lot of great yeah. stuff there, yeah. covered so much ground. Um, yeah. So, I guess I'm wondering that the, at, at some point, I mean, it's interesting that you, you ended up going to study in San Francisco, and some, a movement or a show that was originated in the South where you were from kind of sparked something Mm -hmm. you in San Francisco, it, did you find that San Francisco was going to be a better place for you to approach quilt making because of perhaps a, I don't know, there's something about a man sewing in the South that may perhaps be something that like as a stereotype would be. I mean, it seems there's an element of you liking to yeah. stick two fingers up to, to, the, to the surrounding neighborhood that you found yourself in. So was this kind of like for you just another way of sticking two fingers up to this, taking something traditionally quite feminine and, and coming into quite a, a, a hard scene with it? Right. Um, Actually, and, and is it feminine? I mean, or is that just, this, again, another stereotype that we're kind of... So I would say no to all of that. No, 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 and no. Okay. Yeah. It was a hell of an interview. Yeah. 
Yeah, all can, you, all can, you guys. Can, can you elaborate on that no for, no, for the no. purposes of this? No to part A, no to part B, and no to part C. <laughs> Next question. Well, we but, know. Uh, no, it's like, yeah. but it has nothing to do. I was never trying to like give the middle finger to like the craft. The craft world, or, or women who no more like the, the middle, craft, no, yeah, middle the craft world. To your southern upbringing, yeah, like, yeah, southern yeah. upbringing, maybe perhaps slightly masculine, Newt Gingrich. Not even, like, not even that. that you know, not even that at all. No, because okay. like, um, as my mom says, like our family is very southern. Like we we are from the deep south, straight up. Yeah. And like I I've never tried to like really be away from that. Yeah. At all. So like yeah, definitely not. I mean, what I, I always wanted like I wanted to live in San Francisco when I. I first visited San Francisco when I was probably like 13, 12 or 13. And from then, I, I just, there's something about that city that I just knew I wanted to live there when I got older. And then I got accepted in, into the master's program at the San Francisco Art Institute many years later. And so I was like, I took that opportunity to come to San Francisco. And then after being in San Francisco, that's when I started to actually make quilts. So the first quilt I made wasn't until 2008. So what was like culture shock in San Francisco for you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, we um, can pretty much list every single thing, but well, there's a lot. Like the I most mean, polar opposite places. Perhaps. You know, Atlanta is a pretty big city. It's a major city also. We call it like the jewel of the South. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's a big city. So I got always, always, I lived in a big city. Um, the things, differences between Atlanta and San Francisco are just probably like, um, so I guess just like the social fabric of things. Like you can get away with a lot more in San Francisco than you can in Atlanta by far, and you can buy liquor at the grocery store on Sunday, <laughs> which my dad was just like, this is the best thing ever, you know? And he also likes weed, so, you know. So how did it work for you in terms of getting, finding this becoming something that you realized would be sustainable? Like how, like how did I come to that point? Or like, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I love asking through. artists if their craft is sustainable. Well, that's good. Still, no, that's still, good. Yeah, still yeah, you've gone through to that time. You've yeah. gone through. You've gone through a series of degrees. Right, right. You've studied. You've yeah, definitely yeah. done the institution. You are very much right. now in the real world, and yeah. it's like there's a big moment where you're like, shit, I'm in the real world doing this. Yes. So was there what? How did that path kind of go? Was it just that you found yourself? while you were in, in school getting, you know, um, opportunities coming from yeah, galleries yeah, yeah. and it just felt like it was just I going mean, to I, go that way? Even before, even before uh, grad school, I was always out trying to get shows and that just kind of led into grad school and then that just continued afterwards. Uh, I never really looked at it as like, this is something that I'm going to start doing now. It was always like something I've always wanted to do and I was always making decisions to try to m put myself in positions that got me to where I wanted to be. Is that mm -hmm. going to answer your question? Well, I'm kind of, yeah, it, it, it does. I'm you really just kind of looking answer. for terms of advice for people that advice. were, yeah, that were. The, the were best advice, that's where I kind of The best to advice I could give to me. anyone that's, that's coming up as an artist is to, like, never quit. Like, there's by no means I have, like, the best talented quilt, quilting skills ever, far from it. Um, the only, any success that I've been lucky enough to get is I attribute it primarily to just not giving up and just, and just have kept working and staying motivated. Uh, you know, I, I, one way I kind of look at the world as far as like some people have a fire inside of them and some, some people don't. So either you either make yourself, you push yourself to get what you want or you don't. Um, that's kind of like the short answer and that's, and that's usually what I tell my students also. It's like if you really want this, then, then go do it. You know, there's, don't let anything get in the way of it. So you just dropped something there as well, your yeah. students, so you are a, you're a professor? Right, I am technically visiting faculty at the San Francisco Art Institute is my um, title. Yeah. Does that does that is that like a little awkward because your students can we? It's not awkward, but you can start calling me sir if you want. Yeah, no, but like, is it awkward like when you, when when, you, when you're teaching students who are just about to emerge into an art scene or an art career, and they can look you up on Instagram and see what you do <laughs> yeah. and see varying degrees of success that you've had, right? And sort of maybe. I, I, they, do they have like an interesting sort of interaction with you? Like, well, I mean, uh, you you do quilts and I'm doing painting, so therefore, oh, yeah, I've your had opinion the whole... does not matter to me. Or are they kind of like, well, you're kind of making it, so I, I should probably just listen and shut up. I think, it, I would say my experience with most of my students has been, first of all, they all look you up. That's a totally good. Everyone, well, I mean, they all know what's up. Like, even more so than we probably do about other people. But yeah, absolutely. So everyone's always looking up. And they will always be like, oh, I saw this, 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 and this, and it'll be from like years ago. 
I'm like, oh, okay, good, you've done your due diligence. Don't just take a random class without knowing who the professor is. So like, good for you, okay, that's good. But I, I, don't, I have never, I haven't really had anyone that's come into my class and been like, oh, you make quilts, I'm out. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, fine, well, if you're to stay in my class, you failed. <laughs> yeah. Because right. the first day I usually come down hard and, you know, if you piss me off, I'll flunk you. I don't, you know, I still get paid, so. <laughs> He's a great at what he does. So, it's, it, let's, in America, and I, I can't speak for the way things are in England, but, like, during the Bush years, there seemed to be, like, this re-energizing of craft America. Handmade, made in the U.S. sort of traditions that were kind of being re- Which Bush? The recent one or the... The other one. Uh, the, yeah, George eighties W. Eighties Bush. No, no, no. The the okay. one, the one that like eighties Bush. The one, the new, one that new Bush. The Dick Cheney one. Okay. The one, well, new, they're both Dick Cheney. Yeah. Shh, that's a lot. Of, oh, so complicated. It's, we'll call them the, new Bush. Let's say the early, the early aughts. Um, okay. There was like this sort of um, revival of Made in America, um, yeah. not not in the Trump sense, but like in the sort of craft. Uh, Craft arts, craft beer, everything was mm -hmm. kind of like uh, do it your DIY. I hate using that, right. but um, did you find yourself with kinships with various peers that might have been sort of returning to more kind of traditional American um, styles of production, or or, just, or did you feel like an outlier still? And, and I know we have another artist, Aaron, Aaron M. Riley here, yeah. here, who also kind of works in. Fabrics and right. textiles and all those things. Weaving, so like, yeah. Weaving, yeah. So do, did you find peers easily? Uh, not necessarily, like uh, a handful of them. But I, like the more, more to your, you kind of like asked, like more to like a broader of the question is like, right. you know, like maybe in the last like five to seven years or maybe even a little bit longer, like <clears throat> for me I saw like a more of a movement, this, what I would call, and maybe Aaron would agree with this, is like, this new wave of craft, which was like craft, but being used in like a, in a fine art context at the same time, so kind of like fine yeah. art craft. Yeah. And I never, I never saw that being tied to like made in a, stuff made in America. I just saw it tied to people that artists that were, were kind of returning back to like wanting to like actually work with their hands, kind of coming off of like that first wave of like technology where people like you and I were able to like afford that technology, and then artists were able to buy that whatever that technology was, and then use it in their artistic practice. So kind of that first wave, then that kind of happened. And then I, I think I saw, I started seeing some people like myself, like Aaron, kind of returning back to this idea of like wanting to make stuff that was primarily associated with craft, but we operate in a fine art context. So what I would call like the new wave of craft. Um, but it's interesting you say like made in America. I never kind of really looked at it that way. But kind of also jumping off what Doug asked earlier about growing up in the 90s, you know, I, I, I describe myself as a product of the Atlanta punk rock scene in the 90s. And what more specifically this idea of do-it-yourself work ethic, DIY, mm -hmm. and that's, that was instilled at me from a very early teenage, from the early teenage years, and that's, you know, clearly carried on to now because I make all the work myself. I don't have, you know, a bunch of um, people that are, you know, producing the work for me. I have a small studio in the back of my wife and I's apartment, and that's where I work. You know, I, and I yeah. pretty much just sew all day lonely. Do, do, do you <laughs> lonely crap? Tear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but do you, do you feel at all that like um, paintings are always like the serious thing? Like I'm a painter. I'm just like serious. It's like taken. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Do you do you feel as if um, working in the in the mode that you work that you have to do extra? Sort of explaining of what you do, or do you? Yeah, think sometimes. Yeah. I think uh, I think the the real question to ask is like for me in respect to that is like, you know, what? You're getting, you're getting yeah, the real answer. question. You're, the real question, <laughs> which you're not <laughs> asking. Yeah, but. it's like when you see for work that I do, I think you have to see it in person because it's it's easier to it's either easier to understand what what I do if you see it in person because if you see it online, it's just flat. It, it, it is primarily 2D, but it, it's not. You know, it there's has, a weight to there's it. There's a weight there's to it. There's, it's, it's, it's like tactile. Yeah. And so it's kind of hard to depict that in like online. So like, you know, not that a painting is strictly a painting and it's just totally always flat all the time. A lot of the times it is, but it's not always the case. Sometimes you can paint very heavily and it has some like texture to it. But, um, you know, with my work, it has a little bit more texture 
I would argue, than, than a standard painting that's just strictly paint, like nothing else onto it. So, um, but more back to your question. Yeah, I have found that to do a little bit more explaining because people are like, what is that? Especially if they haven't seen it in person. I was like, oh, it's a quilt. Well, what, I don't, what is that exactly? Do people yeah. need to be explained what a quilt is? Like Sometimes. the history of quilts and like Sometimes. why that might? Where does the, I mean, yeah. does it just keep going back and back and back or is there a, a, a particular period at which this? Uh, I mean, it's gone out? back for like a couple hundred years. The, the quilters in G's Bend have gone back like, um, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, at least 150 years I'm, roughly, I'm, if not a little longer. I think around the 150 range. You said earlier that it's not a uh, feminine practice. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't approach it in that way. Like, for me, I'm, yes, I'm a guy that's working in a medium that's it's been more, more historically associated uh, as feminine, but I, I, I'm in, by no means trying to like negate that history at all. I would make the argument that I'm trying to uh, the work that I do is highly influenced from that history, and uh, I want, I, I want to be part of that. Um, and, and, the, and the work that I do, I've, I, I've tried to like elevate that in some way, in my own way, that I know how to by making my work with working with textiles. Will you always start with a story and then work back, or will you start with a fabric and then work into something else and then research its history or something yeah. like that and then go back and find the story? Or well, where does that relationship sit? For me, like, everything starts the first step for art making practice is like research. So I just have, I have a lot of varied interests like a lot of us do. And I just kind of become interested in this or that and I'll look into that a little bit more, start drawing, working in the sketchbook. Then I take that into like Photoshop, re redefine my design and then I kind of output my design like into patterns like much how you would make like a suit or something, like a tailor, like how a tailor works. And then at that point I just, as we were talking earlier, I just have a ton of piles of fabric all over the place. Then I start pulling that. And it's, by the time I'm like sewing, like I'll pick this fabric, it's like this will, I'll be digging through stuff. I was like, oh, this will look good here. And then and as this part of the design, this piece of fabric will look good there. Um, as far as the story goes in relation to the fabric, you know, it's just a mixed mass of stories that's like, that the fabric has. But as far as the piece goes, that kind of comes together after, after I'm working on the design. So you know. for the viewer, is it kind of like trying to take something individually away from or is it trying to find where you were coming from? Well, for the viewer, like I describe my art as, in one word, my art is a collision. It's a mm -hmm. collision of fine art craft and what I would call the fringes of society, which refers to punk rock, heavy metal, skateboarding, the occult mysticism, um, tattoo culture, tattoo culture, et cetera, gambling. Blah, blah, blah. He said that before. He's done this that one was before. Like, that was a He's list. Done that. He He's done that one before. Yeah, that's your elevator pitch. <laughs> but taking I've never heard that. someone <laughs> rattle something out As soon as so someone quickly. would say it to me in an elevator, I'd be like, what the fuck is with this dude? Yeah. I like it, though. That's yeah, yeah. So I take all of that, and I collide that together. And so when the viewer, when someone, like, when someone sees my work, it kind of really depends on what history they're bringing to it. Are they from the fine art world? Are they from the craft world? Are they from the blah, 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 blah world, right? They always, do they, do you find that they always fit into one of them? Or do, are you ever occasionally quite surprised by who takes I'm always it surprised. Different away yeah, I'm, I'm usually, you, I'm usually surprised. But uh, most of the times you can kind of tell if some dude rolls in wearing a Slayer t-shirt, he's probably going to be one to talk about. Well, you know, <laughs> quilting, the history of, right. history of quilting. Very, right. very standard. So, you know, so she's just in the abyss. Uh, back in <laughs> traditional of quilting, yeah, hella weights, but yeah, you know. No, that, that's good because it leads into kind of what you're doing next month. Next mm -hmm. month, correct? Not this yes. Month. Yeah, next, next month. month in Birmingham, England. Birmingham? Birmingham? The Brum. What it, well, no, I, 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 like, I like it the way that Americans do it. It's good. Birmingham. Uh, yeah. Well, we have a Birmingham. There's, what I said, there's a Birmingham yeah. in uh, Alabama, isn't um, there? Yeah. You're, doing, you're having a museum show that's coinciding with... Um, Black Sabbath anniversary. Right, so it's 50, it's Black Sabbath is celebrating 50 years, which is nuts. So let's, they decided that they were going to have an American artist who does quilts <laughs> yeah. be part of something that yeah. is, which, which you explained all those things that you influence and you're clashing together, that, that is going to represent a band from the middle of England that is one of the most iconic heavy metal, if not iconic rock bands of all right. time. 
Uh, how did, That's how I pitched it. How, is that how they, you pitched them? Or did <laughs> no, they, no, they came. Yeah, how, how, did did that, the, how did it's that... It's a collision. Yeah. <laughs> Skate like, the gambling yeah, tattoo. How did that pitch go? And how did that like come about? Because it's, it's, not only is it, it it's apt for what you do, but mm -hmm. it's also kind of, all right, this is kind of getting into some territory yeah. that's pretty uh, profound probably for you. I no, totally. Uh, they approached me, but I also worked with them back in 2011. I had a show in Birmingham. I think it was at the Wolverhampton Museum. Right, he said it that way. Yeah, so it, like, I'd already had a, a little bit of a history with them, and it's Lisa Meyer. She runs an organization called, she's part of an organization called Home of Metal, and because all these bands are from Birmingham. <laughs> he, for the whatever. purpose of the podcast, he gave me the eye. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Black Sabbath being one of them, and so now, like, we did something back in 2011, and now this is, like, kind of the second edition of it much bigger. So I have a solo show at the Midlands Arts Center. Black Sabbath is doing like an anthropological survey of the band over 50 years at the Birmingham Museum. And then two other artists have shows at museums within, within Birmingham all around the same time. And so, um, yeah, I don't know how they pitched it to the museums, but like they were already familiar with my work and it seemed like a good kind of uh, Juxtaposition. So there, oh, oh, there it is. Um, Good, thank I think you. that one out. Every single time Juxpo's magazine does Everyone anything, has to drink Juxposition has to be used once. Um, have you thought about just coming to the, to, the, the to the gig, the Black Sabbath gig, turning up outside with a sewing machine and a little table and just doing patches? Have well, you ever I, done that before? Because I, I mean, done that, you'd make a killing, but it'd be quite cool. I, I am doing that at, at, the, at the museum the week after, yeah, okay. they were selling patches on for free, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it does make sense that like people, like, especially who are into heavy metal or punk or anything, they, they adorn themselves with certain kind totally, of Totally, totally. Yeah, battle, battle jackets, battle jackets. Yeah, all that yeah, yeah. kind of stuff. So I guess it does, in a way, it, what you're doing is just kind of an a very enhanced version of that sort of like personalization that, yeah. of, of what one, one wants to wear when they kind of go No, somewhere. totally, I mean, that's exactly, yeah, I, I would agree with that 100%, yeah, totally. So that's, the, that's what good. the curators were thinking. Good. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Ideal I, world. I think so. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> I just said yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you've done. You've done quite a lot with institutions, with museums. Ideal world. What would be your dream project? Would it be with an institution like that? Would it be in My you know with project? a with a with a, a metal band? Where would it where, where would it sit? Well, I'm working on a commission jacket right now for uh, the drummer for Macedon, and that's that's pretty you know, important for me being from Atlanta and Macedon being from Atlanta. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, ATL. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. I'm working on that right now. And um, the jacket will go to the to Birmingham to be on display uh, for the for the show. So that that was that was pretty cool. But as far as like an institution, I would one of my main goals, uh, and I mean everyone has a lot of goals, but one of my goals is to show at MONA, the Museum of New and Old Art in uh, Tasmania. Yeah. Uh, was it more specifically Hobart, right? I think it's Hobart. Yeah. Yeah, in Tasmania. Yeah. It's not that big of an island. So yeah, it's yeah, quite small. Get, yeah. But I've, you know, that museum for me has a really interesting kind of curatorial practice or maybe direction, you, you could say, where they kind of mix new and old art, uh, thus the name. And for, I thought that's really interesting because at least for me, and I'm sure a lot of other artists would agree with this, like, you know, I, I do textile quilts, et cetera, but I look at old tapestries for inspiration, and I think having a show where it's like my work was some tapestry from like whatever century, I don't know, I think would be really interesting because I do, I, that work does totally influence me. Right. You know, I have, I'm highly influenced by the, the G's Ben quilters, which, you know, relatively speaking, is more recent history, but I also look at these tapestries that are like from, centuries ago, right. and to have an exhibition that kind of like merges modern day with, you know, work that's 400 years old, I right. think is an interesting pairing. Well, it, it's not your normal run-of-the-mill museum show, I think. You, you were in the Juxpo Superflat show, as well as Aaron, that we did a couple years ago with Takashi Murakami, and you have said before that it's something that you like the fact that your work was being paired with so many different historical kind of crafts and different styles and all these different right. things. It seems like you're very, very conscious of the fact that you like being kind of thrown into the mix with different eras and 
and sort of embracing maybe the, a little bit of the chaos that comes with that, that kind of our, our, the way that we look at art today. No, I think chaos is a good word because, you know, it's kind of, for me, it goes back to like, I just don't want to have like a normal straight up show. I want to do something that's a little bit more engaging, that it's not just like one thing, right? And I think the, that particular show, was, you know, addressed a lot of different issues at once. And for me, that was, it was something that was exciting to be a part of. And also, I liked a lot of the artists that were in that exhibition. I was a big fan of, and it was for me. It was the first time meeting a lot of them in person, and it, that and our work was vastly different. You know, uh, you have like someone doing like really kind of like Dutch master type painting to to weaving to sculpture to uh, you know what else did we have in that? Uh, all kinds. Yeah, of there's so, I mean, there's there was comic lot, books. Yeah. There was toys. There was yeah, all sorts of stuff. Sorry. Yeah, I kind of ran ran the gamut. Yeah. But uh, I thought that was that was interesting. As a lecturer, um, you you're you've got a, a, a <laughs> finger on the pulse with the youth of today, more so than myself <laughs> and Evan. I hope, right? Um, do you see uh, that same DIY spirit coming through in any way? Do you do you get that energy coming from from the people that you're talking to? Perhaps they're a little older. You maybe mean they, my students? And yeah, people, yeah. Like, maybe they yeah, passed. I'd say your kid's probably too young for that. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little younger. Yeah. Um, so no, do totally. you see that kind of energy, and are you able to kind of really explain what that you know what how important that DIY culture when is I, doing it? They can usually spot them like the first or second day of class, like oh, they're into the same stuff that I'm into, and you, you get know, better grades immediately. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're not into that, you fail. Yeah, no. <laughs> everyone passes as long as you do the work and don't piss me off. Uh, but it's no, you, mainly the latter. Mainly the latter, but yeah, it's. It's like the kind of, you know, I do see a lot of the DIY ethic in some people, but that kind of goes back to like either you have the fire inside of you or you don't. For me, growing up in the 90s, it was, it was definitely like the, the era of the DIY, like late 80s into the 90s, you know, Fugazi, you know, book all the shows yourself, et cetera, et cetera, charge only $5. You know, that was a huge influence on me, that kind of, that whole kind of, idea and, and not only the idea, the concept behind all that, the aesthetic with the, that was tied to that and all this, that whole scene was really important. And I think now more, nowadays it's a little bit different, but it's kind of like, it has some of the same qualities. It's just, it's just a newer version of it, I think. And when and some of the students, I, I can see that in them where they are working really hard and, and they are doing all the work themselves, but, but it kind of brings up a larger issue. It's like, once you, as an artist, once you get to a certain level, there, it's impossible to do everything yourself. So at some point, you do kind of have to let go and like manage a little bit, but, um, which is uh, totally understandable. Have any of them, uh, just staying on your students, has any of them suddenly halfway through the class suddenly just gone, oh, I'm going to do quilts? Just like No one's you, so. done that yet that I can recall. <laughs> Uh, like, oh, I yeah. found this heavy metal band. <laughs> yeah, know, right. It ended up on my quilt. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that hasn't happened that yet. hasn't happened Ask yet. Me. Yeah. Not not yet. Okay. Um, we should probably open it up. Yeah. Questions from the audience. I have one last question before we do that. Are, are quilts traditionally a functional object? Or are they always decorative? I don't know. That's a hard question. I would say. And if anyone disagrees, feel free to speak up. I would say traditionally they're functional, meant to okay. be functional. All right. That was a question we had um, before this. We were like, we wanted to kind of, should have asked that yeah. first question. Because, well, think we'll about think the last question. Because for going back to G's Ben, they, would, they were using material that, that, was, that had been worn, that had been, like the men out there working in the fields would wear these denim pants, these shirts, et cetera, and they had been, worn so much they couldn't wear them as clothing anymore, so then they would recycle them into the quilts, which could then be used to keep you warm at night. So functional, functional, functional. Could you maybe, actually, it might be useful for us all just if you could maybe pick out one or two of the pieces that you've got here and maybe give us a little backstory on how sure. you picked these, where the story comes from, and kind of go into it a little bit more. I'll talk about this one. That, I'm glad on you the, picked that one. Left. So that, that piece there is made up of Carhartt, <clears throat> <laughs> I'm joking. Carhartt, Dickies, uh, camouflage fabric, and uh, denim jeans, which would be like Levi's denim. And so. It's a lot of brand drops right there. That's. Yeah. What's that? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm also really into NASCAR, so if, you know, if you don't chew big, if you don't chew big red, then f you. So, uh, but that all the Dickies pants were from my good friend Randy. Uh, he wore all those pants, and his wife made him clean out his closet one day. So he, he came over to my house. He also photographs all my artwork. Shout out to Randy Dotson. Uh, thank you, Randy. And he literally came over to the, my house with like a bag of, of pants. And he's like, I washed these. I was like, I doubt that. <laughs> so I, I, wa I took them and I washed them just to double check. Because my, my wife was like, you should probably wash them just a minute. Uh, so all the, all the Dickies are his. And then uh, I can't remember where the Carhartt coverall came from, but that's totally used. And then the denim is, is a bunch of different jeans that all different friends, friends, family, and just random people have sent me over the years. So I have, I have, I have uh, piles that are separated. I have like a denim pile, I have a t-shirt pile, I have a leather pile. So you are carrying some of your friends' stories along with you. as you Oh, to no, totally. Yeah. Like nowadays people literally will send me boxes of stuff. And a lot of times I don't even know those people. Yeah. But that's the, just to kind of quickly go on a real quick side tangent. As far as quilting, quilting has a very large um, history of like a community aspect to it. Mm -hmm. But I do all the work myself. So the community aspect within the work that I do comes from all the people that donate the fabric. And that's really important to me. I, so it's, I was going to say that it's purely accidental that it seems to be like a kind of working class labor uh, yeah. kind of coming through that. And at work in, in blue collar. Yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? That's like total like all Soho wear now. Yeah, of course. I think Kanye course. wore Dickies to the Met Gala. You did, you did. Yeah, did. $40 yeah, yeah. Dickies. It's kind of changed a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Does anybody, wait, does anybody have any no, questions? No, no, we got questions. Any questions? Okay. Hey, Ange, you're not a okay. End the podcast so soon. All right, they might have no questions. You might get off all right. Spike? Oh. No, sorry. Can you use the mic for the purposes of <laughs> Arlo is just crashing our podcast. <laughs> he goes on one and now he just turns up wherever we are. Have you been to G's Bend and have you related to any of those folks? I've never been there. No, I would like to go sometime. Uh, that would be a great uh, side trip to probably go back to Atlanta and then just straight shot west to there would be a good trip. Yeah, I would like to do that someday. I think that would be... Uh, a great experience. Is that like the holy grail of like going to see? I don't even know how I, I, I just wouldn't want to like impose on them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry to take up your time, you know? Uh, I, would, I would like to do that at some point. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely something I've thought about for sure. Yeah. You get to go back to Atlanta much? Uh, I try to go back as much as possible. I haven't been back in a little while, but uh, I think we're going to try to go back maybe um, this summer. Do you raising you raising a little one though? Or are you trying to make sure that that kind of deep south culture is embedded <laughs> and like, that, that she doesn't go oh, there's something wrong. San Francisco? Something, right. there's something wrong with San Francisco? Doesn't yeah. Yeah. Like Evan. Yeah. I know. Uh, she can start. She'll probably drop a y'all when she gets older. Yeah, you know. Hopefully. Fair. Yeah. That'll be the protest day of your life. She's gonna she's gonna have to eat grits, but yeah, it's part of it. Nice. Yeah. A great something you made. I got one. Yeah, yes. Carlo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, like, great that you want to go to Atlanta in the summer. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> Dirty South, man, yeah. But uh, textile has its own history, mm -hmm. and, like, you know, you talked about wanting to look at uh, the old tapestries, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I always think of the arts and crafts movement in England, and, of course, it's a big contemporary field. But when you talk about G's Bend, I also think about like the whole quilt making tradition from the Amish to Ghana right. to wherever. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the folkloric aspects of your work that that are inherent in that craft, because it's it's not like glass blowing as much. It's it's real folkloric, right? Well, like for me, like the more like the folklore, or I might even say like the occult, kind of comes in more from like the designs necessarily for me, but that's an interesting question. But like, I think the short answer would be as far as like the folkloric aspect uh, in relation to my work specifically is more, is more drawn from like the, the actual design, not necessarily the, how it's made per se. Does that answer is your there, question? Uh, just carrying that on then, is yeah. there a difference in how these traditional uh, traditional periods and regions, how they made quilts, uh, is there differences between them? 
there, I'm sure there are differences. What a lot of those specific differences are, I'm not fully aware of. I, I mean, Either technical or I mean, in terms of... You know, a, a quilt is more or less a quilt. And, you know, you have your top layer, you have the middle layer, which is the batting, and then you have the bottom layer. There's really not a whole lot more to that. For me, I use a sewing machine to construct all my quilts. Uh, obviously, they didn't have sewing machines, you know, for... Back to the beginning of time, <laughs> um, a lot like you brought up like the Amish quilts, the Amish quilt. There was a show that came through that the De Young Museum in San Francisco. I went and saw that show. That show was really interesting, and those quilts were vastly different from the G's Ben quilts. But as far as how, how they were constructed, I honestly don't know what the big differences between the two were. Mm -hmm. I know that a lot of the G's Ben quilters and probably the Amish quilters, obviously because they're Amish, were not using a, a showing, sewing machine that was powered by electricity for obvious reasons. So it's like hand quilted. But I, I'm too impatient to hand quilt anything. That would take forever. And I like to do really large work. I'm not going to hand quilt <coughs> like a 15 foot quilt because uh, I don't have the patience to do that. Nor you, do you find yourself going on sort of, uh, uh, maybe pilgrimage is, is too far stretched a word, but to kind of go see you know, where, these, where these traditional quilts were made and, and the practices that were maybe followed? Um, I mean, that's, something I, like, that's something I would like to do, and I'm trying to find the right opportunity to like merge that with, like maybe it be it like a residency opportunity or some type of like commission or some type of... Uh, you know, piece, uh, like I start working with a certain type of, you know, uh, institution or whatever that is part of this other kind of tradition within that region, you know? A series with vans? Something like that. Like yeah, that. it's like at the right, you know, there's times you have to like, I have a lot of different ideas and a lot of different <laughs> goals, and it's sometimes you have to wait, wait for the right kind of time to like merge the two or three together. Yeah. That is definitely something. That's I, some I good like. content. Wait, in we, that. Didn't, we didn't ask you. Like, do you have like the Mercedes of like sewing machines? Like, do you have? No, like, not at all. You know, it's not. There's like this one where you're like, oh, that's the one. I mean, I, I would describe the first machine I had was a Brother XL twenty six ten. Which I would, well, which I would like. I got a big reaction. Everyone knows heard. exactly they, what I'm talking. They were like sweet piece that's, of kit. That's right. <laughs> that's the Subaru which, of. Uh... No, that's like the shitty Honda Accord. And now I have a Juki F600, which is like the souped-up, like bitch and Camaro version. So there's some tech yeah. talk for you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question? <laughs> Microphone. Yeah, we got a question at the back. Can you use the mic if possible? As a, as a teacher at an art school, how much truth do you think there is behind the statement that art school kills creativity? Whoa. <laughs> art from, school kills deep creativity. There. That sounds like someone who might have some, some student That's debt it. from yeah. art school. Right, <laughs> oh, yeah. right here, too, buddy. I would, I would say art school kills productivity. That's refreshing. Well, you have to go to class. <laughs> When you're so you, and you can't be in the studio, right? You can't do both. But more to, to answer your question directly, I think it does a little bit, but that's really up to you. I, it's more of, I would not look at it from, does it kill creativity? I would look at it as a way, I look at art school as you're going into a program that's pretty intense for two years. And if you come out of that still able to kind of be interested in art, you're probably going to still be making art afterwards. Whereas some people enter the program like, I'm going to be an artist. And they go to do two years of a master's program. They're like, forget about it. And then, you know, it's kind of like it kind of weeds people out. So it's kind of like a good selector for that. Uh, and it's not for everybody. Um, by, by all means, don't just think you should go to art school. You don't have to go to art school to be an artist by any means. Don't think that that's something that is you. It's like this leads to this. No way. Absolutely not. What was it that continuously took you back, both as a as a student and as a as a lecturer? For, but for me, like I was always, I wanted to go into a program that was like a for my master's program, which was two years. I wanted to be in a program that was an intense program where there's a bunch of other people really working hard, trying to like make different things and trying things out. Because one way I look at it is like that's two years where you can kind of do anything you want. You kind of got like carte blanche. Uh, even though you, sometimes you do have to pay a lot of money to, to be in art school if you didn't get scholarships or, or et cetera. But, and just being in that type of like environment was, was in, engaging for me. And that's ultimately what brought me back to wanting to be faculty there is just kind of being able to kind of, you know, put my 
dip my toes into that high level of like craziness and energy. Because uh, I have I have always felt that students learn from me, but I have probably learned more from them. In a, in a lot of ways, in a lot of different ways. And I just like being back in that, that, that environment. So, and the other way to look at it is like, I'm part of this environment, I'm, uh, or I'm part of this kind of scene, I'm part of that scene, and I'm part of this scene. I'm not just part of just one little fine art microcosm scene. I try to be part of all these little things, you know. Did that answer your question? Are you in art school right now? Ah, yeah. I knew it, I knew it. I Didn't see that, that one coming. I felt yeah. that one coming. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, can you please put your hands together for Ben Venom? Um, and another, obviously, shout out to Vans for hosting us. Thank you so much. Uh, and Ben, you're going to be here tomorrow. When to when? Customizing uh, jackets? Noon to three tomorrow. Bring a jacket. I'll put a patch on. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And thank you for coming. And Thank you very much for having me. Woo!